Now it's time for another edition of Modell's Hot Stove Report with your host, Fran Gilly, and this week's special guest, 1969 Amazing Met, the glider, Ed Charles. Modell's Hot Stove Report is brought to you by Budget Rental Car. The smart money is on budget. Hello again, everybody. I'm Fran Healy at the Warwick Hotel in Midtown Manhattan, and you're watching Modell's Hot Stove Report. On this edition, we will talk Med Baseball back in the 60s with one of the favorites here in New York, Ed Charles. Stay with us. When we come back, we'll talk the good times, the bad times, and probably some crazy times. <laughs> When I came into the league, people called me the next Willie Mays. I figured if I'm going to be the second coming, I better stay in shape. So I got a pair of cross training shoes. The other day, I read about some high school kid in Texas. He's hitting 400, hasn't struck out in three years. They called him the next Barry Bonds. Welcome back to the Warwick Hotel in Midtown Manhattan, talking to Ed Charles about the New York Mets, those 1969 New York Mets who are celebrating an anniversary. Ed, tell us your, your remembrances. A uh, friend, that's quite a few things I could recall about the 69 uh, championship season, but most of all, I like to think about the fact that we were such a big underdog, and we came out of nowhere and won the world championship. I think, as you can recall, the city just went wild. No one in the country really believed that the Mets was playing that well. But I think it was a combination of things. We had great pitching, a great defense, and we had guys who could come up and give you the clutch hit. So that along, along with the fact that we had a great manager in Gil Hodges. And as you all know, there's so many winning teams over the, the history of sports. Why do certain teams stick out as, I guess, glamour teams, like the 69 Mets? The only thing I can think of, especially when you talk about the Mets, the fact that the Mets first started out, I think the media played a big part in romanticizing the team, uh, making a lovable type of team, although they was losing every, every time they went out there. They was losing. Uh, it's like Casey Stanger said, can anybody here play this game? <laughs> <laughs> they was proven, so to speak. And I think with the support of the media to romanticize the team because of their ineptness, I think the fans just took to them. And when we came along in 69 and 1, I mean, people just couldn't believe it. I mean, that was something special. And two, remember, we came from a ninth place finish the following year to win the whole thing. And that just didn't happen. What went through your mind when you were in Kansas City and all of a sudden they told you you're going to the Nets? And I believe it was 67? Yeah, you're right, Fred. It was 67, but prior to coming to the Mets in 67, we had a series against the Yankees in Kansas City and all of a sudden uh, the Yankee manager, I think, uh, Ralph Howard, he came up to me yeah, kind of chummy, you know, and I'm like saying to myself, a veteran player, I said, the opposing managers just don't come up and get chummy all of a sudden. So I suspect that I was going to be traded. Because I know in the spring, before the start of the spring training, Charlie O'Fillin had a party for the season ticket holders. So Charlie walked up to me during that party. He said, Ed, if you were traded, where would you like to go? So I just <laughs> said, New York, because back then, everyone wanted to play in New York. New York was the place to play. So I said, New York. So when I saw Ralph Howard getting close to me, I said, maybe it's something amiss. Maybe I'd be going to the Yankees. And when they told me I was coming to the Mets, it didn't make any difference. I was coming to New York, and that's where I wanted to be. So. And back then, uh, for our younger viewers, uh, the, the Kansas City team was considered, even though it was a major league team, because they made so many trades with the Yankees, it was considered a Yankee minor uh, league team. Bob team of the Yankees, <laughs> is that right? Because if you can recall, I think, 
He had such players like, uh, I know Hector Lopez was one, uh, Roger Maris, prime example. He came from Kansas City and one of these type of trades where you say, well, the Yanks reached down to their farm team, Kansas <laughs> City, and pull up a guy like boy, Roger Barris. And you had a little left-hand pitcher, I think, named Bud Daly. You remember him? Sure, sure. He came up, and then there was Hector Lopez came over and did a heck of a job for the Yankees. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot going on between the Yankees and Kansas City prior to Charlie Finley. There. One thing that Charlie wanted us to do, as I, as I can recall, my five years of playing in Kansas City. One was to beat the Yankees. Two, beat Chicago. Anytime, friend, we won a series from the Yankees or Chicago, Charlie would walk in the clubhouse, pull out a wide of $100 bills like this, go around the East Locker, pass them out to the guys, go have yourself a nice dinner. That was Charlie. If only two teams were concerned about. Was Charlie as colorful with Kansas City because he was brand new in, in baseball at the time, as he would become with the Oakland A's as their owner? He was. He started a lot of promotion type of gimmicks uh, that I think just propelled him to the forefront as far as uh, being wacky, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I remember the time we had what they call an industry night in Kansas City. And each pl player was in the starting lineup that night. Charlie had a little mule train, little donkeys, right? And each one of the starting players had to mount one of these donkeys and ride out to his starting <laughs> position. <laughs> but if you can recall, he took it a step further. We had a mule as a mascot. And every Berkeley Park that we played in, Charlie would transport that mule, that mascot, to that ballpark. And one, only one owner uh, resented that Charlie would bring a mule to his ballpark, and that was Arthur Allen in Chicago. He told Charlie, you better not bring a mule in here. <laughs> we picked up Satchel Page. Remember Satchel Page, the legendary Satchel Page, right? And 66, I believe it was, towards the end of the season. I remember that. So the only way Charlie got that mule, a mule, I won't say that particular mule, into Comiskey Park, Charlie had a little small donkey crated up shipped into our clubhouse, the attendant outside the door, asked the delivery fellow, said, what you got in the crate? And the fellow said, we got a rocking chair for Satchel Page. Well, that's, that sound reasonable. So they let the, the crate inside the clubhouse. The guy in the clubhouse, they had the crate thing, here come a donkey, and they ushered him out onto the field. Huh? <laughs> I, I'll tell you, what, it, was, it was hilarious, believe me. And we was winning a ball game, 2-1. And the mule came out on the field, Everything stopped. We just went. <laughs> <laughs> but this, this was just one of the type of things that he would do. I mean, he had some crazy, forward ideas, and some, some of them were very positive. Some were very good. The colorful type uniforms that we wear in the day was Charlie's idea. You know how that old drab look and stuff like this, the color like the white shoes and, and all that type of stuff, the green uniform and caps and stuff. Charlie started all that trend. You mentioned Satchel Page. He was obviously in his 50s, late 50s, wasn't he? Satchel might have been close to 70. <laughs> <laughs> what was he like? Uh, he was an amazing person. Matter of fact, I, I roomed with him that year. Well, not the entire year, because we, we brought him in for some big promotional type gimmick, because the increased sales at the gate. And uh, it was billed that he would pitch against Boston. I think he was only there for about a couple months, latter part of the season of 66. And uh, it was some show, believe me. Uh, he had to be in the 60s. And what he did in three innings against Baltimore, I mean, uh, Boston, was unbelievable. All the young guys on the team, including myself, we like saying, oh, this young man, this old man go out on this mound, he's going to get knocked around, right? He went out there for three innings. He just shut down Boston. And Boston had a, a, a great ball club. They had Yastrzemski and Canigliario and all these type of guys. And I think Yaz was the only one that got a hit off him. That was it. Three innings. I mean, amazing. You know, looking at your career, it doesn't happen. It rarely happens today. You signed in 52. Right. One year in the military service? Yes. And 
with that one year military service, nine years in the minor leagues before you played a day in the major leagues. True. Well, see, I initially signed in the Brave organization. My senior year in high school out of St. Petersburg, Florida. As a matter of fact, I signed a pro contract before my class graduated. But I wasn't aware that they weren't supposed to sign me to a pro contract. But anyway, my first year, I went up to Quebec City, Canada. And for the next 10 years, I was under minor league contract with Braves organization, although I, I was in service for 21 months. But when I came back out of the service, you know, I was still in the Braves organization. But luckily for me, the winner of 61, I was traded to Kansas City Athletics. And uh, 62, I got my first shot at the big leagues. I think I was about 29 years old at that time. But now, I started my career as a shortstop. Later, I was switched to the second base. And at that point, I felt that I was ready to come to the major leagues. But you only had uh, uh, 16 major league teams back in those days. And you had players stacked up from Class D, Fran. You remember Class D all the way up to AAA. And some of those guys at AAA level, they could have been playing major league ball, but mm -hmm. there's no spot, no place for them. So I just had to wait my turn. We had guys like... Murray Wills was down there for about nine years. A lot of guys spent a lot of time in the minor leagues back in those days. There was no place for us to go, no place for us to play. Each major league team had about 21 minor league teams. I'll give you some idea of the player pool that you had back in those days as opposed to now. And if you look at the major league alignment now, as far as the minor league clubs, I think most of you will find each major league team got about four or five minor league teams. That's it. Well, with, with all those players in the minor leagues, there was a lot of time on his hands. Ed Charles, in the minor leagues and the major leagues, learned how to write poetry. We're going to talk more baseball and some poetry when we return. Welcome back to Modell's Hot Stove Report. We're at the Warwick Hotel in Midtown Manhattan. I'm Fran Healy talking Mets baseball with Ed Charles, a man who remembers those 1969 Mets. But a lot of people remember Ed Charles not only as a baseball player, but as a poet. How did that all start? Oh, God. Fran, um, I can recall when I was in high school, I was really into literature. I really loved that, okay? But I never felt that one day I was going to try to compose a poem myself. So I, I recall that one winter while I was down in Puerto Rico, I was uh, playing for San Juan, and uh, Roberto Clemente was my manager that year. And we had a lot of spare time, so I just started uh, dabbling and putting, writing stuff and putting it on paper, etc. And I've gotten a lot of encouragement from people in academia and stuff like this, so encouraged me to continue. So well, I kept at it, kept at it, and now I feel I'm at the point where I can compose some pretty good stuff. And uh, I have uh, been published. Uh, a lot of the major newspapers, like the Times, and uh, I know Dell Publication came out with a uh, a little book on spoke points by athletes and stuff like this, and I submitted one to them, and so I've been getting a lot of a little push about this. If if there was a player in your time that would remind you of poetry, who would it be? Mm. Would it be Mays? It would be one. Clemente would be another. Uh, we talking about just uh, the mannerism, the way they Grace, go about playing the yeah. game, et cetera, stuff like this. I was very fortunate coming along in the 60s because we had so many great players. And you can look at, you can say Mal, you can look at uh, uh, just watching Killer Bruce swing at a ball, even if he missed. I mean, you had guys with poetry in motion, whether with the batter, with the glove, you name it. Uh, you take guys like Willie McCovey, Hank Aaron, just watch Hank Aaron swing the bat, or watch Clemente out there. I mean, I was very fortunate to see those guys uh, come along when those guys did. And not only that, I played against quite a few of those guys. I know. You mentioned home run hitters uh, as far as poetry was concerned. Uh, Who was the most awesome? You, you mentioned some heavyweights. Who was right. the most awesome home run hitter when he walked to the plate and he took his stance? I mean, Killebrew, as you mentioned, I mean, 
intimidating. Christ. Oh, uh, well, you had to start out with, with guys like McCarthy, mm. Killer Brew. I mean, they walk up the plate uh, right away, you know, think somebody's going to hit a line, drive somewhere. <laughs> you think it's out of there, you know? And I remember playing third base and Killer Brew up and stuff like this. And uh, normally, you know, you play your regular position, which we might be halfway between the infield grass and outfield grass when an average type hit is there. A guy like Killebrew come up, I'm back on the edge of the outfield grass because <laughs> if they hit a, a, a ground ball, it's going to be a scorcher. But you put guys like that really strike fear into pitchers. And just to watch them swing, or just to watch that mannerism, the way they went about the game, etc. I mean, it, just like you say, it's just poetry. Just like they said about Joe Dimaggio. I never did see him play, but they say he just glided all over the field and just grateful stuff like this. I mean, Fans, uh, I wish they could have seen some of those greats back in those times play the game, baseball. We're talking to Charles, and we're going to talk about the New York Mets, the 69 New York Mets. They have a lot of things yes. going on this season. Yes, this is our 25th anniversary, as you know, Fran, and I want to take this time out to thank you and Spoke Channel for so supporting us the way you've been because of your interest. Other people have joined in, and they have uh, generated a lot of interest and there is, to this day, 25 years after, a lot of fan interest in the 69 Mets. I mean, it's amazing. Uh, we had a big card show in the Meadowlands about three weeks ago. Temperatures hovering around zero degrees. And for two days, Saturday and Sunday, we had a steady stream of people in and out of that Meadowland Hilton Hotel. Unbelievable. And since then, we've had um, uh, up the up up to Met Fantasy Camp down in Florida. Some a lot of the guys was down there a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Shamskin, Crane Pool, and AG and myself just left the con call last night. We have a big uh, golf event coming up with the muscular dystrophy in uh, May 3rd at Westchester County. That's going to be another big event to bring everybody together, plus the banquet. And uh, we got the cruise August 13th. That's going to be one of the highlights of the year for us when we take that cruise August 13th to Bermuda. And we're looking forward to that. But throughout the year, there's going to be a lot of activity going on. And we probably have some old-timers games in um, some of the minor league park with some of the Oreo guys that we beat in 69. <laughs> <laughs> so looking forward to that. But a lot is happening. But what is so amazing to me is the fact that the interest is so high. I mean, um, I just, I don't want to believe it, but it's there. It's still there. A lot of people relate to that 6-9 team, and I guess they want to look back on this montage themselves, so I guess that's why the interest is so high. It's well, great. Uh, before the show closes, uh, we will list uh, some of the events and celebrity crews will also be listed. As far as getting together with these guys, right. does it seem like you've ever been apart? for all these years? Not really. But it's, it's such a big thrill after all these years to get together with the guys. And I must say, the 69 Mets still look good. They are healthy, well. And that's the part that really makes you feel good. Um, we did lose a couple of members. We lost one player, Kevin Coots, here recently. And uh, that sort of hurt us a little bit. but. Um, uh, quite a few of us went down to the benefit they had for Kevin in North Carolina, and uh, we gave his wife and family all the support we possibly can. And uh, naturally, we lost Hodges and manager, and we lost Rue Walker, pitching coach. So mm -hmm. we lost three three people from that team. When you when you look at the Mets today, uh, just an absolutely terrible season last year, 103 losses. If you were they're going to win this year. <laughs> I, I do feel this 94 team is going to surprise a lot of people, Fran. Believe me. Uh, they got some young players. Well, they surprised a lot of people last year because a lot of people thought they were going to win it last year. Okay, they thought they were going to play much yeah. better. Well, Nobody thought, well, I shouldn't say nobody. The, yeah. Very few thought the Phillies were going to win the division. That's true. That's true. Why would you say the Mets should turn it around? I do feel that the young players, that they, the Bernie Ryan, these type of guys that they come into the ball team and uh, a few veteran players, even though they got Mike Reynolds back, a lot of people don't like Mike Reynolds. I still like Mike. Matter of fact, when I was scouting for the Mets, Mike was on my draft list. 
But I still like Mike, and I still think he can contribute to the ball club. And uh, I think this uh, acquisition of who, Davis from Houston. Clint Davis. I think that guy's going to surprise you, too. My big concern is, can Franco come back and do the job in the bullpen? Do they have anybody coming off the bench that can come up with the clutch hit, stuff like this? But I do feel that they are going to play much better, inspiring type of ball than the team last year. I think we're going to have to sort of uh, live with the team a while. They're going to make a few mistakes, but uh, I do feel they're going to play much better ball. I really do. You mentioned uh, some of the some of the things you have to be concerned with, John Franco. Hope Doug Gooden uh, coming off a losing that's season. That's another one, right? Saberhagen, if he's kept. That's a, that's Saberhagen could be the key to that staff. If he's sound and got it together, he could be the key. How do you convince the fans, the Met fans, uh, that that this thing can be turned around? Because 103 losses, they're still trying to get over that. I know. Uh, if uh, the Daily News and, and Post and all these guys can convince the fans back in the early 60s to support a team of losing 100 games a year, <laughs> I'll leave this up to Spoke Channel and the rest of the guys to convince the fans to come out there and support the best of 94. And I'm, I'm sure the players are going to try to do that. I'm talking to Ed Charles. and talking present-day baseball. We've talked about the past. we talked about poetry. Stay with us. Final thoughts right after these messages. Here at the Warwick Hotel, talking to Ed Charles on Modell's Hot Stove Report. We're running out of time, so one last question, Ed. Right. If you could bring back one moment from 1969, what would it be? One moment from 1969, what it would be? Just to that last final out, uh, game number five, when Cleon Jones caught that ball, and I went dancing across the mound in midair. That's the moment I would bring back. Ed, it's great. Thanks for joining us on the show. Thank you, Fred. Well, that concludes this edition of Modell's Hot Stove Report. As I mentioned, we're in Manhattan right now. Next week, when you tune in, it'll be Sunday night. We'll be talking Mets baseball from Stewart, Florida, right near the home of the New York, spring train home of the New York Mets. So tune in at that time when we will talk more Mets baseball and we'll take your calls. Good night, everybody. inside pitch. The Hot Stove Report has been brought to you by Budget Rent-A-Car. The smart money is on budget. Promotional considerations provided by the Warwick, New York, Deluxe Manhattan Hotel. Steps from Radio City, Broadway, and exciting restaurants. Unbelievable $125 rate. Call 800-223-4099. Brought to you by Business Express, the Delta Connection, with over 550 flights a day to 30 cities in the Northeast. Fly the best seat in the sky. For information or reservations, contact your travel agent or Business Express at one 800 345 Three, four hundred.